Paul and Timothy, both of us committed servants of Christ Jesus, write this letter to all the followers of Jesus in Philippi, pastors and ministers included. We greet you with grace and peace that comes from God our Father and our Master Jesus Christ. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I'm so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. But it's not all fanciful for me to think this way about you. My prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put on trial, and came out of it in one piece. All along, you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love and miss you these days. You know, sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but love well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. I want to report to you, friends, that my imprisonment here has had the opposite of its intended effect. Instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. <laughs> All the soldiers here and everyone else too found out that I'm in jail because of this Messiah. That piqued their curiosity and now they learned all about him. Not only that, but most of the followers of Jesus here have become far more sure of themselves in the faith than ever, speaking out fearlessly about God, about the Messiah. Now it's true that some here preach Christ because with me out of the way, they think they'll step right into the spotlight. But the others do it with the best heart in the world. One group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I'm here defending the message, wanting to help. The others, now that I'm out of the picture, are merely greedy, hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Their motives are bad. They see me as their competition. And so worse it goes for me, the better they think for them. So how am I to respond? I've decided that I really don't care about their motives, whether mixed, bad, or indifferent. Every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I just cheer them on. And I'm going to keep that celebration because I know how it's gonna turn out. Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything He wants to do in and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or die. They didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Alive, I'm Christ's messenger. Dead, I'm his bounty. Life versus even more life. I can't lose. As long as I'm alive in this body, there is good work for me to do. If I had to choose right now, I hardly know which I choose. It's a hard choice. The desire to break camp here and be with Christ is powerful. Some days I can think of nothing better, but most days, because of what you are going through, I'm sure it's better for me to stick it out here. So I plan to be around a while, companion to you as your growth and joy in this life of trusting God continues. You can start looking forward to a great reunion when I come visit you again. We'll be praising Christ and enjoying each other. Meanwhile, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on whether or not I come. Your conduct must be the same 
whether I show up to see things for myself or hear of it from a distance. So stand united, singular vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they're up against. Defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. There's far more to this life than trusting in Christ. There's also suffering for Him. And the suffering is just as much a gift as the trusting. You're involved in the same kind of struggle you saw me go through, on which you are now getting an updated report in this letter. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if His love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to those advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death, crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. So do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering, no second guessing. Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night so I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof I didn't go to all this work for nothing. Even if I'm executed here and now, I'll rejoice in being an element in the offering of your faith that you make on Christ's altar, a part of your rejoicing. But turnabout's fair play. You must join me in my rejoicing. Whatever you do, don't feel sorry for me. I plan, according to Jesus' plan, to send Timothy to you very soon so he can bring back all the news of you he can gather. How that will do my heart good. I have no one quite like Timothy. He's loyal, genuinely concerned for you. Most people around here are looking out for themselves with little concern for the things of Jesus. But you know yourselves that Timothy's the real deal. He's been a devoted son to me as together we've delivered the message. As soon as I see how things are going to fall out for me here, I plan to send him off. And then I'm hoping and praying to be right on his heels. But for now, I'm dispatching Epaphroditus 
my good friend and companion in my work. You sent him to help me out. Now I'm sending him to help you out. He's been wanting in the worst way to get back with you, especially since recovering from the illness you heard about. He's been wanting to get back and reassure you that he's just fine. He nearly died, you know, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, he had mercy on me too, because his death would have been one huge grief piled on top of all the others. So you can see why I'm so delighted to send him on to you. When you see him again, hale and hearty, how you'll rejoice and how relieved I'll be. Give him a grand welcome, a joyful embrace. People like him deserve the best you can give. Remember the ministry to me that you started but weren't able to complete? Well, in the process of finishing up that work, he put his life on the line. He nearly died doing it. And that's about it, family. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I've written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry. So here it goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs, those religious busybodies. All bark, no bite. All they're interested in is appearances. Nice, happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it, even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials. I mean, you know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Exactly. All the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I can get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ. God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. Now listen, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those who you see running this same course, headed for this same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times. Sadly, I'm having to do it again. All they want is Easy Street. They hate Christ's cross. But Easy Street is Dead End Street. Those who live there make their bellies their gods. Belches are their praise. All they can think of is their appetites. But there is far more to life. For us, we are citizens of high heaven. 
We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like His own. He'll make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which He is putting everything as it should be under and around Him. My dear, dear friends, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy. Fill me with such pride. Don't waver. Stay on track. Steady in God. I urge you, Odia and Syndicate, to iron out their differences and make up. God doesn't want his children holding grudges. And oh yeah, Sisygus, since you're there to help them work things out, do your best with them. These women worked for the message hand in hand with Clement and me and with other veterans, worked as hard as any of us. Remember, their names are also in the book of life. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute now. So don't fret. Don't worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for the good, will come and settle you down. It's so wonderful when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse, Put into practice what you've learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that, and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. I'm glad in God. Far happier than you would ever guess. Happy that you're again showing such strong concern for me. Not that you ever quit praying or thinking about me, you just had no chance to show it. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. I don't mean that your help didn't mean a lot to me. It did. It was a beautiful thing that you came alongside me in my troubles. You Philippians well know, and you can be sure I'll never forget it, that when I first left Macedonia province, venturing out with the message, not one church helped out in the give and take of this work. Except for you. You were the only one. Even while I was in Thessalonica, you helped out. Not only once, but twice. Not that I'm looking for handouts, but I do want you to experience the blessing that issues from generosity. And now I have it all, and I keep getting more. The gifts you sent with Epaphroditus were more than enough, like a sweet-smelling sacrifice roasting on the altar, filling the air with fragrance, pleasing God to no end. You can be sure, sure, that God will take care of everything you need. Everything you need. His generosity exceeding even yours in the glory that pours from Jesus. Our God and Father abounds in glory that just pours out into eternity. Praise God. Give our regards to every follower of Jesus you meet. Our friends here say hello. All the Christians here, especially the believers who work in the palace of Caesar, want to be remembered by you. 
receive and experience the amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, deep, deep within yourselves. <laughs>